Well, that's a lovely introduction, wasn't it? So no pressure, first up, um, of the whole festival, so uh, hopefully this goes all right. My mum's done my PowerPoint, all right? So she's an old, old school teacher, but she's done my PA, so hopefully it'll work. Oh, there you go. So, there's, um, so basically what I wanted to talk about, we, we were told when JP gave me, um, well, a tweet, not a, te not a text or a phone call, but it's all done via Twitter, he said, um, can you come over to Ireland and can you talk about the future of food in your eyes? Okay, so obviously that's a massive subject, the future of food. Um, where it's going to go, no one really, really knows. But I just wanted to really put my stamp on it and to really, from my point of view, how I think um, things are going to go. But to understand where things are going to go, you have to really understand um, the past and obviously the present and then we can talk about the future. So obviously I am a chef, not a public speaker, so I apologise if I uh, sort of uh, am not the greatest, but I'll, I'll try my hardest, I promise. Um, so the, I explained the, the actual title, Reflections of a Seafood Chef. Well, it's just really my observations, my thoughts, um, what, I, what I think, um, what I see day in, day out, running sort of uh, four restaurants and a pub. Um, and yeah, and that's, that's pretty much it. So. There's that one, and there's, there's the little one. So there's me when I was 17 years old, um, and I was working at that time at the Intercontinental in High Park Corner. So um, my, f my earliest sort of food memories were, um, obviously, before you introduced about my father being a chef, um, he still is a chef, and I was exposed to a lot of food as, as a child, but not really um, what you would, ex you would call sort of fine dining food. It was... My dad, he proclaims himself to be the best pea and chip chef in the land um, because he can knock out a few covers, right? So uh, it, it's quite interesting. So my early food memories were really of the kitchen, uh, not so much about the food, but more about the, the camaraderie, about the whole sort of the way the, way the kitchen was run. Um, my, and the fam my family are all from the food industry. So granddads, na Navy and Army, both cooks, grandmas, both cooks. Um, father, cook, mum came from the front of the house and later on became a teacher. She saw the light. She got out of the kitchen in the in in industry. Um, but funny enough, now she's back in it with me. Um, and so, you know, so until I was sort of like, as I said before, eight, eight I was in the kitchen. Um, by sort of 14, I actually had a proper job at working in restaurants. Um, and it was, yeah, and I, I just loved it. So um, a lot of people say to me, why seafood? Why, 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 why did I go down the seafood route? Well, I was fascinated by seafood as, as a youngster, but not the actual eating of it. The only, th the only thing I would eat as a kid would be them sort of fish-shaped fingers that were wrapped in them lovely breadcrumbs, so uh, with a captain on the front. That was as far as I went. So it wasn't until I was about 18, years, or 18 19 years old, I left London, and I went to work for Rick Stein. Um, and then I saw the light. You know, Rick, Rick for me is, a, is my idol, he's one of my heroes, and I got a chance to actually work, work with him. And that's when I actually sort of started thinking, you know, this is what I love doing, and that's when I stuck to seafood. So I met, I met my wife down in Cornwall. Um, and I'm sort of explaining about where I'm coming from, because obviously a lot of people don't know where maybe Cornwall is. Um, so, you know, it's just explaining that Rick was a turning point for me. Um, and he wasn't, I didn't come into the industry for like Michelin stars or for accolades. I didn't have a clue what any of that was. I, I actually come into the industry because I love to cook. Um, and when I saw fish cookery, seafood cookery, what excited me about it was the challenge. You know, meat cookery I can do, vegetable cookery I can do, pastry, I sight of avoid, I'll leave that jockey, he can do the pastry. Um, but I, I, I really sort of just love the seafood and the challenge from it day to day. Wild products coming in, you don't know what to do with them. So that's what I saw when I worked for Rick. So, what have you got next? So Cornwall, a little bit about Cornwall. So I'm going to tell you, you know, it's a, flat, it's a far flung western corner of the British Isles. So very, very isolated, which is a mixed blessing. So from a point of view, of, from a seafood point of view, you've obviously got a problem. Um, you have weather problems. Yeah, and it's really difficult to fish there. Um, and also you have the problem of being seasonal. So as, a, as running a business, you do have this time of year, um, a bit of a ghost town so that's the other thing it's 280 miles from london so a lot of people think when they come over to eat at the restaurant especially the international diners 
the Cornwall's just outside London. It's a bit further than that. So we have to make sure that people know it's a five hour drive. Um, it's warmer than most places in the British Isles. Um, so we've got lots of microclimates. Um, we're lucky to have the, um, the Gulf Stream as well, which actually brings a lot of different varieties of seafood to the, to the shores. Therefore, you know, if you take the North Sea, for example, you've obviously got, a, you know, you've got quite a limited amount of, of, of uh, seafood. There's not loads of species. In Cornwall, there's probably around about 35 usable, when I say usable, people that would eat species that you can actually serve in the restaurant. Um, it's quiet and peaceful, though, so I actually do like it. I go out to London every other week to my restaurant there, but I do love coming back, I must admit. Um, what else should I say? And it's, as, as Cornwall is a place, I'm not actually calling it. My wife is, the kids are, the dog is. I'm not. Um, and they're actually very, very proud about their heritage and about everything that they do there. So um, it's a great place for me. It's not just about the Cornish pasty and the clotted cream. There's lots of other, other things there as well. So next thing, I'm going to show you a little bit about the Cornish coastline. So this is um, a view from a place called Port Gaven. Uh, my restaurant is there, just right there. So we've got that lovely, lovely view um, that sort of looks over the sea. Makes sense to have a really, really good uh, fish restaurant with a location like that. I'm very sort of, uh, that view's terrible, isn't it? It's a really horrible view. <laughs> and a little bit of... Um, Geographical information. Um, it's surrounded, the whole of the Cornwall coastline, surrounded by about 422 miles of, of steep cliffs. So it makes it really, really difficult for fishermen to actually get out. Um, so when you, you know, I always sort of flip back to sort of the thing I saw um, last week. I did the AA Awards and I cooked for 1,150 people, which is just mind boggling. Um, and to actually see that amount of turbot um, was actually disgusting really, in a way, when you sort of see how much fish, and I know exactly what the challenges these guys have. If you imagine, that's actually quite rough there. They wouldn't go out on a day like that. Um, it, doesn't, it looks quite calm to a lot of people, but it is actually quite dangerous, especially when you consider most of the boats are small one and two men crew. Um, it's, it's a dodgy old place to, um, to fish out of. So it also got, what Cornwall does boast as well, is it's lush, the, the interior farmland. So you produce great livestock. Really, really good dairy. Yeah, the vegetables are fantastic. Like I said about the microclimates before, they, they produce some fantastic stuff. Um, the granite moorland as well. So you've got really, really good water, so, which obviously makes everything, you know, which everything great and grow really, really well. Um, and it's got a, yeah, the history of fishing, farming, and mining. Obviously, the, the copper, tin, and china clay mining was a huge, huge thing for Cornwall. Um, yeah, back in the day, and it's one of the things really that's sort of shut down now, so it's not, not there anymore. Um, and then obviously Cornwall's a major uh, destination uh, for, for holidaymakers, you know, five million people per year. Um, yeah, and when you consider Port Isaac's got um, about 700 people that live there, you know, five million people hanging around in, in Cornwall, it's quite a lot. So under a lot of pressure when it comes to seasonal business. Isn't it? You can tell my chefs that anyway. Okay, so the let's Next one. Okay, so a little bit of history about Cornwall, just briefly, because uh, I've got six minutes and 39 seconds left. Okay, <laughs> um, so it's documented in the, in the, since the Middle Ages as uh, the most economically developed coastline in Britain, and that's really because of its position. Yeah, the fishermen there were really sort of the trade and everything, they could really sort of, uh, you know, get ahead of anywhere else. And in the 1700s, they started the, the same method of fishing, which basically the whole, you can imagine, the whole sort of community, a whole village would actually, would do that. So the fishermen would go out, but the actual villagers would pull the nets in from the actual, from the beach. And everybody would be involved in that. Um, and that's when they started the mackerel and the pilchers and the herrings. And obviously from that, you also got the other work. So you had the the, the processing, the villagers would process stuff. They would, they would they'd make all the clothes to the fishermen. So the whole community was involved in the fishing process. Um, in the 1800s, they started you know, smuggling and wrecking was supplemented uh, due to things like the prices. So um, most of the landowners in, in Cornwall would actually go, would be from the cities, and they sort of didn't really care about the, the little people in, in, in the in the in Cornwall and places like that. So they ended up um, sort of uh, charging so much rent that they actually started having to sort of smuggle and wreck. And wrecking basically what meant that they would, and this include the, the women and the children, they would light beacons and they would actually draw ships in as they were coming back from obviously, um, yeah, we're full up and they would make them wreck and then they would just go and get everything. So it wasn't just, you know, this is, this is what they had to do to survive. 
Um, and there's still evidence of that now. If you come to, to Cornwall, you can see that they used to, yeah, they, how it used to work. In the 1900s, they improved the machinery, the transport, um, and the means of getting fresh fish to London and other cities. And that was vastly due to Brunel when he's sort of railway. So you had the Great Western Railway that came all the way up to the coastline. Um, and then you had the mess, sort of the mass exodus of all the miners to the New World when all the mines closed. So what you were left with was this massive sort of void of like no work ghost towns, which you can still see now. Um, and it's, you know, when you, you go down to the far west of Cornwall, it's, it's a pretty bleak place sometimes, especially at the winter time. So, so here's uh, two fishermen, present day now. Let's talk about the present day. Father and son, Julian and Sam, um, predominantly lobster fishermen. So the fishing industry is still important. Um, this is a good one for your sustainable aspect. So you've got 896 fishermen, but only 601 vessels. So that tells you that the fleet in Cornwall, very, very sustainable fishermen. There's only one, two men crews. So there's not many big trawlers and not many big beam trawlers or there's certainly no pair trawlers. You don't get pair trawling there. Um, yeah, you know, but the thing is, the farming is still important as well, but hospitality has taken over. So before all the farming and the fishing industry, now hospitality is the thing, which is obviously where, where we come in, and which is great for me anyway. Um, but they still obviously very to uh, tight-knit communities. As you see, these are father and son. Sam's got a son who's also started fishing, and the grandfather still. So it's four generations, and they're still doing it now. So I'm going to flick through the next bit. So the challenges for the future, obviously, what you've got is the um, EU quotas, stock issues, international competition causing the decline in the Cornish fishing industry. And that's really down to the quotas very, very small for the Cornish fishermen um, and the British fishermen, actually, in general. So a lot of other countries are getting huger amounts of quota than we are. Uh, which, and then when you consider that when you go to like Spain, France, Italy, all these lovely, wonderful markets, a lot of the fish is actually from the UK and from Ireland. It's not actually from them areas. So... Um, a lot of it's going, going abroad, and that's, a lot of that's down to our public not really appreciating the diversity of, of, of seafood. So, um, you know, this is something, the challenges of the future is getting more people to eat different, different species. Staffing is also problematic, especially front of house and within the industry, um, which is all the chefs that are coming up over this couple of days will tell you exactly the same thing. Um, yeah, but that's where I try and do it. I've got an academy, we got apprenticeships, and we are, you know, we're trying. Um, but it's not easy. It's not easy. So these are the sort of challenges that I've sort of seen. I'm not going to answer these questions today. I'm just sort of chucking it out there for people to think about. So, so Port Isaac, as you can always see, beautiful. I'll whip through these. 700 people there. Now, this is uh, my main restaurant. So we relocated it in March this year. Um, it's actually been open for since 2007. It's on its third site. So that sort of shows you the pressures you're under with business. I mean, I had it in two hotels with business partners, um, but now I've gone, gone solo on my own because I just fed up with that sort of whole um, interaction with, with business partners. I'm a bit solo. Apparently, I'm unmanageable. But there you go. <laughs> so, uh, but, but then actually, it's, that's freedom for my mind. So. But as you see, you've got two Michelin stars for the last five years, four rosettes, uh, nine out of ten in the Good Food Guide, and fourth in the country for UK restaurants. So, yeah, we've done pretty well with that one. It's not too bad. And this is a typical sort of dishes from... We do an eight-course menu there, uh, all local court sustainable seafood. Uh, the one on the left is sort of lemon sole, oyster. It's very typical of something very simple that we do. On the right-hand side, port Isaac crab with local asparagus. Um, it, first, so that just shows you the sort of style of food that I do. It's sort of not mucked around too much and let the sort of flavors speak for themselves. Um, one minute, 12 seconds, and get through these. Okay, so this is my um, one star as well in Port Isaac. So Port Isaac, 700 people said before, I've got two restaurants there, one with one star, one with two stars, both seafood only restaurants. So if you don't like fish, don't come to Port Isaac. That's basically what you're saying. This one's from the 1500s, this building. Um, it's the oldest building in the whole of Port Isaac, and it's only got 18 seats. That is the total brigade, them two chefs on the, on the left, and that's the total front of house, the girl on the right. There's three of them in there, and that's all they do. So it's all small plates using whatever the fishermen bring in. That's the typical plates that we got there. On the left-hand side, you've got a John Dory dish with roasted vegetables. And then on the right, you've got... A, um, what I was showing with this sort of uh, slide here is that's a, you know, fish that are different species. So on the right, you've got a gurner, which has been cured, um, which is sort of a process you don't usually see with a fish like that. Now, these are the other restaurants that we have. Um, and they, I just want to show diversity when I explain these. Um, they're both called Outlaws as a brand. Um, it's pretty easy. It's my surname, but... Um, it, 
one is in London, one is in Rock. Um, and they're both very different um, in terms of the, the customer base. So we have to be very sort of, it's still high quality dining, quite informal in a way. The formality is more in London, a bit more informal in, in, uh, in, in Cornwall. Um, but we do start to cook a bit of meat there. So if you do like meat, you'll be all right. And then we've got the pub as well. So the pub, really what I want to do is bring back a no, no fuss pub grub. So on your, you've got some mussels, which you can actually see the mussel beds from the window of the pub. On the right, it just shows you some of the cheeses that are just in Cornwall, and the dairy is fantastic. So we just sort of really champion whatever we can get hold of. Uh, this is my big thing. I'm out of time, but I'm just going to... This is my future concerns, and I'm just going to wrap it up with, with this thought, really. Um, fish, basically. My future and my concerns is... The biggest concern is a, is a fish restaurant like mine actually sustainable in itself. Forget the fish. Is it sustainable to have a seafood restaurant that serves premium, the best sustainable fish? But you know, I'm, I'm hopefully cooking for another 20 years, and I have to. I continually ask myself, um, am I going to be able to continue? Recently, we had to put the menu up from 99 pounds to 120 pounds, and I don't want to charge 120 pounds. But to to serve that sort of seafood, you have to do it. So you know, I'm I'm worried about the next 20 years. Where can you take it? I mean, there's only so much people can afford. Um, so, what am I going to do? I'm going to leave that with you lot. There you go. That's me.